Well, we've come to the third part out of eight of our sermons on the life of Jacob. In this section, we're going to look at something just a little bit different. We've been looking at encounters between people. But today's sermon is more about an encounter between Jacob and God. Now, I've talked about three recurring themes throughout this series. And the first one is that none of these people are what we would call pillars of faith. None of them, not Jacob, uh, not his brother Esau, not his mother Rebekah or his father Isaac, none of them are people that we would look to and say, there is a life of faith that I should emulate. The second point, though, is that the faithfulness we find in the story is God's faithfulness. The third part is, the third theme running through this, is that this is a story about God being present in everyday activities. What we see going on in the story of life of Jacob are mostly things that, other than the conflict that people create because of their lies and manipulation, are everyday activities. Not miracles. This isn't a story of a lot of miracles. But what we're going to see today is it is a little out of the ordinary. It is uh, something a little different. It's not a huge miracle. It's a dream. But it's a very significant dream that has a big impact on Jacob, though we'll see not exactly completely the right impact that he should take from it. So here's what we've seen so far. Uh, this this uh, life of Jacob and reading through it, some of you will know what I mean by this. This family, Isaac's family, reminds me of another family, the Ewings. If you remember that, the old TV show Dallas, where the drama is not that they're a rich family that owns oil wells. The drama is in how they treat each other and how they're always scheming. So if this were a uh, an evening soap opera like Dallas, we would have a previously on recap, and this is what we would see. We would see Esau and Jacob wrestle in the womb before they're even born. They're, they're wrestling, they're fighting for supremacy. We would see Jacob extorts Esau's birthright. We'd see Esau marries some local Hittite girls, and that causes all kinds of problems, especially for his mother, Rebecca. We would see Jacob and Rebecca con Esau's blessing from Isaac. And we would see Esau decides to kill Jacob. This is hardly a story uh, that would get a G rating. This is, this is people lying and manipulating and cheating and now planning murder. So after catching up on all the drama that we've seen so far, we need to ask a really important question. So Jacob extorted Esau's birthright, and Jacob and Rebekah conned Isaac to give Jacob the blessing that was supposed to be Esau's. So we have to ask this question, is Jacob's claim as the one who inherits the promise from God legitimate because that's really what this whole story is about is how God is going to pass the promise on from generation to generation we saw it pass from Abraham to Isaac and now it's going to pass from Isaac to one of his sons either Esau or Jacob right now Jacob is in position to inherit that but we have to ask is that legitimate now don't jump ahead and say, oh, in the New Testament, it says Jacob's one of the great patriarchs. We're not there. We're in this story. And what we've seen so far is Jacob using extortion and con games to place himself to where he will inherit that promise. In today's world, Esau could take Jacob to court and he could sue Jacob. And I have no doubts then when it comes to uh, the blessing that he received from Isaac, the courts would force him to give it back. 
because that's just a flat-out con to get that blessing. Probably, the, the courts would probably make him also give back the birthright. Though if you got just the right lawyer and just the right judge, they could convince them maybe that it was a legitimate business transaction. Though I think most judges and most lawyers would see it simply as extortion. But there was no judicial system to go to back in those days. There were no courts, there were no judges, there were no lawyers, for better or for worse. So Esau decides his solution is simply to kill Jacob. Kill Jacob, and the whole question of who is the legitimate heir goes away, because there will only be one heir. Now, Rebekah seems to know everything. So Rebekah gets wind of what, Isaac, or what Esau has planned after Isaac dies, that he'll kill his brother. And so Rebekah then has a plan. They have one lie to take care of another lie, one con to take care of another con. And this is what Rebekah does. She goes to Isaac and she says, I'm weary of my life because of these Hittite women. She's talking about her daughters-in-law, these, these local Hittite women that Esau has married. They make her life miserable. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women such as these, these being her daughters-in-law, one of the women of the land, local girls, what good will my life be to me? What good will it be, Isaac? I can't have my son Jacob marrying one of these. It's bad enough our son Esau married one. Isaac agrees, and he does something, well, kind of unexpected. Isaac calls Jacob to him, instructs him to go home to their ancestral lands, the same place where uh, a servant of his father Abraham found his wife, Rebekah, for him. Go home to Rebekah's family and find a wife. And he says this. He says, God Almighty bless you and give you many children. And your descendants multiply and become many nations. God pass on to you and your descendants the blessing he promised to Abraham. You own this land where you are now living as a foreigner. For God gave this land to Abraham. So Isaac is accepting Jacob's claim as the legitimate heir to God's promise. That's surprising because the last time we saw Jacob and Isaac interact, Jacob was conning him out of that blessing and that birthright. But now Isaac has accepted it. We're not told why. We have really no basis for even speculating anything other than Isaac has now accepted it, that this is the way it's going to be. But what about Esau? Will Esau just stand by and watch his last hope of getting his uh, legitimate place as the firstborn back? Well, he has one more card to play. He thinks to himself, okay. My parents are mad I married some of these local girls. And they're going to send my little brother back to mom's home to find a wife, a legitimate wife, who will please my parents. Well, I got some relatives here. If they want Jacob to marry a relative, I can marry a relative. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women, the Hittite women, same thing, they're just mixing up the words there a little bit, did not please his father Isaac, Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahaloth, daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael and sister of Naaboth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. So Esau thinks that marrying a relative will appease his father and maybe get him his birthright back. It doesn't work. They're the wrong relatives. You see, they're from the branch that was created to try and force God's hand in carrying out this promise. The, that's how Ishmael was born. He's not Sarah's son. He's Hagar's son. So Sarah concocted this crazy idea to make the, the, the promise God 
gave them come true through Abraham having a child with her maid. The, the blue lines, parent and child, the red lines are by marriage. So if we look at this, it all starts with Terah. Terah had two sons, Abraham and Nahor. Abraham had Ishmael through Hagar and Isaac through Sarah. Nahor had Bethuel. Then Ishmael had this Mahalath that Esau married. Bethuel has Rebekah that Isaac married and Laban, who is the brother. He'll be big in next week's story. And then Jacob marries Leah and Rachel the daughters of Laban. So to put this in a little bit of perspective, Esau and Mahalalath, that we just read about them getting married, they're half cousins. They share a grandpa, but have different grandmas. Isaac and Rebekah, who are the parents of Jacob and Esau, are first cousins once removed. And, and this is where it gets really strange. Jacob and his mom are second cousins. Jacob and his dad are first cousins twice removed through his mom, meaning that Jacob's maternal grandfather is his dad's cousin. If, it, if that's not confusing enough, listen to this. Terah is Jacob's paternal great-grandpa. And, and through his mom, Terah is his own cousin once removed. I can't even say that with a straight face, that someone is their own cousin once removed. It, it goes beyond sort of just having a real high yuck factor of their marrying cousins to being something that's ridiculous. I'm sure I could work this enough. I might be able to come up with the song, I Am My Own Grandpa. Maybe it comes from this family lineage. It's just crazy. It's a closed loop. And, and this is where Jacob is going to go. He's going to go home to find a wife. And it's going to be his uh, second cousins, or first, yeah, second cousin once removed. So Jacob leaves on this journey. We saw this map a couple weeks ago. It's the same route that the, 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 the servant take, took Abraham's servant looking for a wife for Isaac. So here's, here's what's happened. This is uh, how it's recorded in Genesis. It says, meanwhile... Meanwhile, meaning while Esau is busy marrying his half-cousin. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled towards Haran. That's their hometown. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. While Isaac accepted Jacob as a legitimate heir, God has added something here. God has added the full promise back saying, you're going to have all these kids, you're going to have this land, and you, through you, the whole world will be blessed. What God has done here is formally accept Jacob as the legitimate heir to the promise. Now, if you've ever heard anyone talking about this dream and this Jacob's ladder, talking about it has something to do with how you get to heaven, put it out of your head. It has nothing to do with that, other than its connection to the promise God is making to Jacob. 
It has everything to do with God endorsing Jacob as the heir to this promise. Too many well-intentioned people over the years, this goes way back, even to the time of Jesus, people talked like this. They're well-intentioned people. They want to make this stairway to heaven as part of their story. It's not part of their story. It's not part of my story. It's not part of your story. It's part of Jacob's story. And it is only part of Jacob's story. God has appeared to Jacob in this dream to tell Jacob that he was the God of Abraham. He was the God of Isaac, and now he is the God of Jacob. Jacob wakes up from this dream. And he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. He's just running for his life. But he was also afraid. And he said, what an awesome place this is. It's none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against, and he set it, he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God. Beth is house, El is God. Anytime you hear a place named with Beth at the beginning, like Bethlehem, means house of bread. Although it was previously called Luz. So Jacob memorializes this event. But then what? Now we have a problem. Because Jacob wasn't, it wasn't enough for Jacob to just accept what God said and make this memorial pillar to remind him and everyone that came by what God had said, this promise God had made. J Jacob should have just closed his mouth at that moment, but he doesn't. Jacob keeps talking. Then, we're told, Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worship. And I will present it, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gave me. See, what Jacob did. He took God's unconditional statement. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And now I am the God of Jacob. And I'm giving you this land and I'll give you all these descendants. And through them, the whole world will be blessed. There's no conditions. God is saying it. This is what I'm going to do. And Jacob turns it into a conditional statement. If you do this, God, if you protect me, if you provide me with food, if you provide me with clothing, if you safely bring me back to this place, then, and only then, will you be my God. Then, if you do all of those things, you will be my God, and I will give 10% of everything I have back to you, and this stone will become a house of worship. Here's what's going on. Rebecca has accepted Jacob as the legitimate heir to the promise. In fact, she was pushing for it all along. Isaac has accepted Jacob as the legitimate heir. God has now accepted Jacob as the legitimate heir and receiver of the promise. But Jacob has not accepted that Jacob is the legitimate heir. He still sees himself as a person who needs to trick and extort things that he wants. He's treating God the same way he treated his brother. His brother's starving to death and he comes along and he says, give me something to eat. And Jacob says, yeah, give me your birthright. I'll give you something to eat, but not unless you give me the birthright. God comes along and says, I'm going to do all these great things for you, Jacob. And Jacob says, yeah, do them first, and then you can be my God. But if you don't do them, you're not going to be my God. Protect me, feed me, clothe me, bring me home, and then you can be my God. Then I'll worship you. Then I'll give my 10% to you. 
Jacob has a long way to go before he's going to come back to this area and be named Israel, prince of God, leader of God's people. If God had waited for Jacob to be uh, worthy of receiving the promise, it would have never happened. That's one of the, the, one of the things I love about reading the story of Jacob's life. It is so connected in that way to our lives. If God waited for us to be worthy of forgiveness and worthy of being part of his family, it's not going to happen. But he doesn't wait. While we were yet sinners, Paul wrote in Romans, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for Jacob. He doesn't wait for us. He comes and he gives us this unconditional statement. This unconditional statement of love and grace and acceptance. And then he goes to work on us. And that's what we're going to see in the next several weeks in Jacob. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you are not a God that waits for us to be ready, but that you come to us just as you came to Jacob. You give us your unconditional promise. Too often we want to put conditions on it, but you don't. And we just pray that you will help us to be accepting of that, that you love us, and that you give us your promise of love and grace and mercy and salvation. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.